Awesome. All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Josh Kaufman, and just a little bit about me before we begin. I started working in EdTech as a student employee, and after I graduated, I went to work for Boston University. Since then, I've worked at a number of the colleges around the Boston area. I did graduate work in instructional technology and instructional design. Currently, I'm at Tufts University doing research in EdTech, as well as supporting classes, events, and producing webinars. I also have a small consulting business. So you might be asking, why am I here today speaking about inclusivity? Recently, there has been a rapid development of new educational technologies. And at the same time, there's been an adoption of new teaching methods. These two factors have combined to make education more inclusive and accessible than ever before. We're, this means we're at a pivotal moment. Okay, why does this keep doing that? Yeah, the other clicker, yeah. I think that was happening in a previous one, okay. Uh, this means we're at a pivotal moment in educational technology. This is a map of Twitter usage. As you can see, we're more digitally connected than ever before. We're at a point where the focus on individual solutions for students with disabilities can be shifted by using universal design principles to focus on the development of universally designed ed tech solutions that are both effective and cost effective, as well as effective for the student with disabilities and for the wider community. Learning is no longer constrained by the physical classroom. And in fact, students are learning every time they engage with digital materials. Really, we all are. Not too long ago, my dishwasher actually started to leak, and I wasn't super happy about having to call a plumber. I did some research online and actually found a tutorial that walked me through the entire repair. Technology has now put the tools to learn complex ideas and processes right in our pockets. And learning is now taking place anytime, anywhere we choose. But how can we bring this anytime, anywhere learning into higher education? One key way to do this is to make sure that all class materials, including the lectures, are available online. This doesn't just benefit students with disabilities. It allows all students to review material they may have not quite understood. However, some instructors have expressed their concern that if they post their lectures, their students won't show up for class. In the past, I accepted that as an important argument, until a surprising conversation I actually had with my uncle. He leads uh, seminars in historic preservation for professionals in that field. And I told him about the instructor's concern. His immediate response was to ask me, why? From his perspective, the students were going to learn the materials one way or the other, either by going online or being in person. What I didn't understand before this is that it's this paradigm shift we have to make and encourage others to make in order to take full advantage of universally designed ed tech solutions. I know that universal design has been discussed at some previous meetings of this group, but I want to make sure we're all starting from the same point as to how it relates to what I'm going to talk about today. I like to start my conversations about universal design with faculty and administrators by asking how many of them use captions when they watch Netflix and asking them for examples of how. So just a quick show of hands, how many of you use captions when you're watching Netflix? All right, why don't you just randomly shout out an answer for why? Those are two very common reasons I get. The other two most common I get are people are watching while their spouse is sleeping or they're having trouble understanding the accents on British TV shows. <laughs> I use this as a point to, uh, to start the conversation about how technology originally developed for people with disabilities can actually benefit a wide range of users. Universal design is so useful in providing a framework for how to use technology because it calls for a variety of alternatives in how information is presented and how students demonstrate their understanding of it. By combining universal design principles, which promote access to education to a broad range of learners with the growth of ed tech, we can shift our focus to the creation of universally designed ed tech solutions that are effective and cost effective. One essential way to do this is to encourage the use of digital devices in the classroom. And I actually get pushback on this. And OK, I know we've all seen people like this guy here checking their Facebook in class. And that does lead some instructors to question whether there's actually a benefit to allowing digital devices. But the reality is that the benefits really do outweigh the distractions. By increasing the number of digital devices in the classroom, we actually increase the number of accessibility options we have available to us. I'm going to talk about a few of the ed tech solutions that can be implemented fairly easily. Lecture capture has become the default in many of the classrooms that I work in, and it can be incredibly effective for a wide range of learners if it's implemented well. 
just before I go on to some more points about that, just a quick aside here. When I talk about accessibility and lecture capture, I always need to make the point that we need to make sure that every speaker is using a microphone. And I know we'll all get that client who sits there and says, I'm loud enough, I don't need a mic. <laughs> the thing is, and this is what I tell them, it's not about making them louder. It's about making sure that their voice is picked up by the ALS and the lecture capture. One important way to use lecture capture to its fullest is to record and provide the slides in addition to the lecture video and also to provide a separate audio track that can be uploaded to the student's mobile devices for any time, anywhere learning. These tracks are not hard to produce, and there's a wide range of tools available that make it really easy to actually just split the audio off of your video recording. These recordings don't just benefit students with disabilities or with undiagnosed disabilities or whose first language is in English. They also benefit, for example, commuter students who want to listen to the lectures while they're traveling, or for traveling student athletes as well. A lot of instructors, in my experience, do provide copies of their slides and their lecture notes for these students. However, there's a lot of other instructors who are unwilling to pro uh, provide this material because they're worried that it'll either be stolen or it'll be shared outside their class. So I've developed a few different ways that I reassure them. One of them is to remind them that they control the release of their material and how much actually goes out. So they can actually cut parts that they don't want to be seen, for example, the Q&A session. I also remind them that there are ways to record it that are a little more secure. For example, they can record it with a watermark or record it in a proprietary format that has to be watched in a specific viewer. On the institutional level, it's actually a really good idea for schools to have an in-house server that hosts the lecture capture videos rather than having instructors have to post them in the cloud on some on a service such as YouTube. Moving along, one of my favorite free tools right now is actually the auto captioning from Microsoft and Google. It's literally universal design in your pocket. I don't know if anybody's seen this app or the plugin for PowerPoint. Bas what it is, is it actually can translate and caption live speech. And it can run from the mic, you can run from the microphone on your phone, which is something a lot of the instructors that I've worked with have been very excited about. It's also really simple to set up on a bigger scale. Both tools are really simple to set up uh, with running through the computer by either feeding the audio feed into the computer or through a BYOD option where the instructor is wearing a Bluetooth that connects up to the computer. Microsoft's product allows for simultaneous captioning on the presentation as well as on any learner's phone, laptop, or tablet. Learners can select the language that they want to see the captions in and they can even send questions back to the instructor through the app. Microsoft also allows you to download the transcript of your talk for review and distribution. Google offers Google offers a slightly less advanced tool, and right now it only offers live captioning. But I'm fairly certain that something is going to change with that soon. Um, another relatively low-cost solution, and these have come up repeatedly throughout this, are Catchbox mics. And a lot of instructors have gotten excited about these. They're a lot of fun. They're a great way of keeping your class engaged. But what people don't think about is they're actually great for accessibility as well, because they allow you to put the Q&A session into the ALS and the lecture capture. I'm not going to go into the technical specs because I'm sure you've all seen them throughout the week. Um, I'm going to speak for a minute also about inclusivity and accessibility in art history classes. These give us another great opportunity where mobile devices can be used to increase accessibility, particularly in terms of streaming back to the main class um, visits to art galleries or museums. Students can benefit from a fellow student or their instructor's visit to a distant museum or in, say, a history program visiting national parks or historic sites as well. Art history classes provide a particular challenge when it comes to accessibility as well. Even if the visual materials are properly alt text uh, captioned or have a descriptive audio track. One of the most fascinating and dynamic solutions I've encountered is actually the, a few companies are, that are producing 3D printed tactile replicas of works of art for patrons who are visually impaired. And not only do these accurately model the image, they actually because they're laser scanned, you can actually feel the different brush strokes and layering of the paint. Currently, they're pretty expensive, and they're not that widely available. But when they become more widely available, they will benefit like, any art history class, because unlike the original works of art, you can actually touch these replicas and gain a deeper understanding. Before I go into some longer term solutions, I want to make a deceptively simple point that I'm sure is obvious to everyone here. Regular preventative maintenance is critical for accessibility. As the bulb dims, it becomes more difficult for everyone to see, and poor audio quality really affects everyone negatively. So therefore, regular preventative maintenance is absolutely critical when it comes to accessibility. 
At some schools where I've worked, the disability office has been completely separate from the AV office. And further, the EdTech team had no responsibility whatsoever for providing accessibility solutions. At other schools, the two departments worked closely together. I believe that going forward, by applying universal design principles, we can actually provide, as the EdTech team, many of the solutions. For example, we can actually replace the existing ALS systems, which are largely RF or IR based, with new RF Wi-Fi hybrids, or like Sennheiser has here, the just pure Wi-Fi models. And these will allow any learner to tie into the audio feed in the classroom using their personal mobile device. Now, of course, these are the sort of things that often have to wait until a room overhaul, particularly because of the budget issues. And it can be difficult to get administrative buy-in because it does appear that the upfront cost is higher than maintaining the existing system. However, in the long run, it's actually much better financially to have these systems that are benefiting all learners rather than are focused on individual solutions per student. Another longer term solution, of course, is the development of collaborative learning spaces. There's a wide range of tools that can be used to facilitate these, ranging from the obvious, like facility overhauls and room modifications, to, to cloud-based solutions, like the Google for Education suite, which can actually turn any classroom into a virtual collaboration space. These uh, spaces actually blend very well with flipped classes, where the students are completing their uh, lectures outside of class and working together on collaborative projects in class. Largely, in my experience, these have been used by um, engineering programs, but they can actually benefit a wide range of fields. This photo of Boston was taken not far from where I live. In the winter of 2015, we had four blizzards back to back, and the whole city was basically shut down for a month. All the tools that I've talked about today would actually reduce the impact of weather or illness on education, because the students would no longer have to be present 100% of the time. By adopting a blended class model in particular, where students complete some of the work online and some of the work in person, education could continue even in weather situations like this. Instructors could hold a synchronous online session or upload a pre-recorded lecture in order to keep class momentum going. I told you I was going to keep it short, and before I wrap it up, I'd just like to thank you all again for having me here from Boston to speak. I just have a couple of more thoughts before I wrap up. Necessity is the mother of invention, and instructors will always seek solutions when they encounter difficulty. That is a great moment for us for EdTech innovation. These solutions can be either hardware or software, and many of them are free or low cost. And as administrators and instructors are exposed to more of these EdTech solutions, they'll become more comfortable with them, and they'll be uh, more willing to adopt them in the future. And therefore, our role will continue to grow and continue to spread. All of this means that if we follow universal design principles, we can actually shift our focus away from individual solutions to these universally designed EdTech solutions that are effective and cost effective. Thank you again so much.